The Path is a teaching series sponsored by World Missionary Evangelism. We hope that this series will deepen your knowledge and walk in our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's your host, John Cathcart. In the last program, we asked the question, is the message to the seven churches of Asia Minor that was given to John, is it just for those seven specific churches in what used to be Asia Minor and is now part of Turkey, was it just for them or is there a wider application? Now in this program, you know, a lot of preachers will just tell you what they think and that's the beginning and the end of it. But I am citing for you the opinion of different men of God. And we can all learn from each other and likewise, no one of us has the last word. I don't care if you have a papal committee. There is more in the Word of God than ever came out of it. It's an ocean. Jesus said it's a treasure out of which men bring forth both things that are old and new. Well, Schofield made the comment that the message of the church has had a fourfold application, one, to the local church, two, as advice to churches of all time, three, to the individual, to you personally, if the message, if the shoe fits, wear it. If you read something in the message of the churches and it's quickened to you, and, and, and it's, you know, it takes a hold on you, then go with it. But fourth, Schofield says, it has a prophetic application as disclosing seven phases of the spiritual history of the church he said, let us say from A.D. 96 to the end of the age. And then he goes on to say, it is incredible that in a prophecy covering the church period, there should be no such foreview. These messages must contain that foreview if, that's a big if, it is in the book at all. Again, these messages, Schofield says, by their very terms, be, go beyond the local assemblies mentioned. And most conclusively of all, these messages do present an exact foreview of the spiritual history of the church and in this precise order. And here's the order he gives. Ephesus, he says, gives us the general state of the church at the date of writing. Smyrna, he says, gives us the period of the great persecution. Pergamos gives us the church settled down in the world where Satan's throne is. And he says, let's say that occupies a period of time after the conversion of the Emperor Constantine when the church became the state church in A.D. 316. Then he says Thyatira is the papacy or the papal church developed out of the Pergamos state where Balanism or worldliness and Nicolaitanism, priestly assumption, have conquered. As Jezebel brought idolatry into the church, so Romanism weds Christian doctrine to pagan ceremony. It certainly did. Sardis, he says, is the Protestant Reformation whose works were not fulfilled. And Philadelphia is whatever bears clear testimony to the word and the name of Jesus in the time of self-satisfied profession, which is represented by Laodicea. Well, when Schofield says that the message of the churches is local, admonitory to all churches, and personal to the personal believer, I can agree with that. But statement four, that it is prophetic as disclosing seven phases of the church throughout history, I think this is a little iffy because it begs the question, and it argues that because something ought to be, it is. And there are many things in this world that ought to be and aren't. So you have to be careful with that type of begging the answer question. However, I have put together some popular presentation, people who think that this represents divisions of the church in history. I've put together a table of popular presentations of this concept, and we put it on a tabulation for you, 
I'll ask the TV director to throw it up on the screen. There are nine columns. It's entitled Historic and Spiritual Periods of the Church. Column one is the number of the church. Column two, historic description. And for the first church, I've called it the emerging period. Column three is the historic period. And I put dates of 34 to 161 AD on that. Then column four is the biblical name of the church, Ephesus for the first church. Then my description of the spiritual condition of the church, it's a declining church. I think everyone agrees with that. Then the spiritual period, I think, is 52 to 161. It's from the Council of Jerusalem to 161. Now, Spiros Zodiatus, who's quite a Bible scholar, says the spiritual description, column seven, it's an apostolic church. In column eight, he says the spiritual period is from 43 AD, day of Pentecost, to 161 AD, which is the persecution of the church that was started by the Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius. And the ninth column is this consolidated spiritual description. In other words, my description and Zodiatus' description. And this column reads on this particular table, the church is apostolic and declining and it's being persecuted by the emperor Marcus Aurelius, or it begins the persecution with Marcus Aurelius. Well, whatever view you take, it is very clear that the time frame of the revelatory scene of John's apocalypse is from the functional establishment of the church to the ultimate establishment and ordering of Israel. The timeline of the message of, to the churches is from the time of Christ until the kingdom is established on earth with Israel as the head of the nations. Now we can add some evidence that this is so. You look at the repeat, the rewards uh, to the first and last churches. The first is the eating of the tree of life and the last church gets to be seated with Christ on his throne. And if you remember our table or our chant, what is man, you'll see here the tree of life and you'll see here seated with Christ in his throne. At the heart of everything World Missionary Evangelism does is reaching out and saving the lost through sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We do this through native missionaries. Right now, we have many native missionaries who need sponsors. That's right, partners just like you who will help them become full-time workers for Christ. That provides this native missionary with the ability to give his life full-time to gospel outreach. We also need Bibles. That allows us to share the word with those we reach in the mission field. If you would like to either sponsor a native missionary or provide the gift of Bibles, simply call us at 1-800-501-2851. I think we have done a reasonable job 
of establishing the fact that the church is to be involved in establishing the kingdom of God from the time of Christ until he returns. So where does the idea come from that the church isn't mentioned in the book of Revelation after the first three chapters of John? And that all that follows applies to the end of the age. In other words, there is a common idea held by evangelicals and Pentecostals that the church doesn't appear in the book of Revelation after the conclusion of the third chapter and that from the fourth chapter and on it applies to a short period of time at the end of the age. Now where does that idea come from? There's a lot of things we need to stop and question and ask where did that idea come from? Well the idea came about due to the Protestant Reformation. When the Reformation took place and the scriptures were opened, as the reformers read, particularly the book of Revelation, they came to the conclusion, and you can see why, that the Roman church was the man of sin, the son of perdition, and the Antichrist. And Quite frankly, there was plenty in the book of Revelation to support that view. Well, this so disturbed the Roman church, and remember, the Roman church was the church in that day and time. The Roman church called a council at Trent, Trent is a city, to decide how to counter the Reformation and how to answer this charge that Rome was the Antichrist. And I have to give the leaders of the Roman Church credit for not just brushing it off, but for saying, could this be true? Well, a Spanish Jesuit named Francisco Ribera was charged with the task of investigating this matter and when he was through, he reported back to Rome that Rome was not the Antichrist, but that the Antichrist was a mysterious figure who would appear at the end of the age. And there was plenty of grounds for that. Ribera, however, also added the opinion that everything after the third chapter of Revelation was in the future. Well, if everything after the third chapter of the book of Revelation is in the future, then obviously the Roman church can't be the Antichrist because the Antichrist is also in the future. Well, in the day and time of the Reformation, the reformers rejected this Roman argument as being ridiculous. But the problem was that later evangelicals and Pentecostals adopted Rome's argument and developed it as a method for interpreting prophecy and interpreting the book of Revelation and it was called futurism, it's all in the future. Now if you consult the internet, you will see that Ribera is recognized as being the father of futurism. So the father of this view that the church doesn't appear after the third chapter and that everything from the fourth chapter to the end is in the future, that idea came from Rome. And by the way, Rome doesn't believe that themselves. So we have a ridiculous situation in that evangelicals and Pentecost, many of whom will quite unabashedly damn Rome and totally condemn it. In fact, recently, pastor of the First Baptist Church in Houston called Rome, Roman Catholicism, a pagan religion. 
So you have this ridiculous situation that evangelicals and Pentecostals who damn Rome have accepted Ribera's Spanish Roman Catholic Jesuits theories on the second coming and end time events. And as I've said, Rome doesn't even believe it themselves. This was a classic piece of work by the Catholics. It led to an escapist religion in which the Protestant church got focused on the rapture and going to heaven and getting out of it all. We're, we're out of here. We're getting out. And while the Protestant church was the, certainly the evangelical and Pentecostal side was turning to that viewpoint, guess what Rome was doing? Rome was evangelizing the world. If you ask the average Protestant, tell me about the Counter-Reformation, they don't know. But the Counter-Reformation was a movement in which Rome, having put the Protestant church to sleep, went out and evangelized, aggressively evangelized the world, particularly the Hispanic part of the world. Well, to illustrate this, I'm asking our TV director to put up a picture of the Council of Trent and a picture of Ribera. You know, there's a famous saying that's been used in politics, would you buy a used car from this man? Let me tell you, take a look at the picture of Ribera and ask yourself, would you buy, buy into the doctrines of this man? Well, I don't see anything in that man that looks very anointed and full of revelation to me. No, I wouldn't buy into his doctrines, and I do not buy into his doctrines. And the evangelical church and the Pentecostal church never should have bought into his doctrines, but they were promoted and put forward by a defrocked Anglican priest from Ireland and England. England. World Missionary Evangelism, through its wide variety of mission outreach programs, is an evangelical force in developing nations, and it all begins with native missionaries. Called by Christ to do His work, our native missionaries are first and foremost soul winners. Often facing hostile opposition, they have the courage to reach out in compassion to the lost, sharing the good news with those in their communities. But that is just the beginning of WME's evangelistic programs. World Missionary Evangelism reaches children through vacation Bible schools and Christian schools. So even as we feed the hungry bodies of little ones, we also feed their souls. For almost six decades, WME has been building churches in both urban and rural areas. Most of these churches are used every day of the week and become beacons of light in the areas where they serve. Churches not only provide worship opportunities, but they also offer a community gathering point, education, child care, and even serve as feeding centers for the hungry. WME not only sponsors native missionaries, we train them. World Missionary Evangelism has local pastoral education programs for new missionaries and continuing education programs for those who have been in the field for years. WME also has Bible colleges that provide degree programs for those seeking a fuller knowledge of the Bible and Christian outreach. The evangelism in World Missionary Evangelism is not just a part of our name. It defines our mission, our focus, and is at the heart of everything we do. At this point, I think it might be well worth recognizing that there are four schools of thought about Bible prophecy. The futurist view has been so well promoted and so sold that most Christians don't know there are any other views. But let's look at them. The first view is the poetic approach, which says that Revelation is a poetic dramatization of the struggle between good and evil. Well, there's nothing controversial about that. That won't get you attacked by the left or the right. In my opinion, that's a cop-out. 
The second theory is the preterist approach, which says that revelation was about events that happened at the time of the early church and has nothing to do with today. Question, does that include the heavenly Jerusalem? Obviously not. Now you have to get selective to believe in that view. Then there's the historicist view, which says that Revelation, the book of Revelation, the visions thereof, are progressively fulfilled in history from the time of Christ until the second coming of Christ. In other words, you can spread Revelation out across, across the historical timeline from Christ to the present day. Then the last approach, the Futurist, says that the first three chapters of Revelation apply to the church and all the rest is still in the future to be fulfilled at the end of the age. Then you may say to me, well, which of these schools of thought are you following? And my answer is I find flaws and, and glaring faults with all of them. And the teaching that I am presenting is none of the above but is a different way of looking at John's apocalypse, and I trust I have the Lord's direction in this. Now, I think the key to understanding the message to the seven churches can be found in the number seven and in the experience and the spirit that John had on Patmos on the Lord's Day. So let's visit that matter. What is the significance of the number seven? Why? was the golden candlestick seven-branched. Well, the number seven relates to the seven spirits of God. The number seven speaks of completion as illustrated by the seven notes of each musical scale. And eight is the number of a new beginning of fresh cycle. If you want to drive people nuts and get a piano and hit C, D, E, F, G, a, B, the seven notes, and then stop. And your mind automatically wants to add the eighth, which is the beginning of a new cycle. The number of creation days was seven, with the seventh day being the day of completion and rest. The number of yearly feasts of Israel was seven, and those feasts dramatized the plan of God to restore his purposes in man. The number of earthly covenants that God made was seven, leading to the new covenant. Thus, seven is a very significant biblical number, and it is especially so in the Revelation of John where we encounter several sevens, as in the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven vials, etc. Now, to me, it seems very biblically logical to expect the seven churches to relate to all these other sevens in some way or another. John was told to write to the angelos of each church. The KJV v translates angelos as angel, but the word also means messenger, an implication, by implication, a pastor. So when John is told to write to the angelos of each church, the natural explanation is, the, is that these messengers were men sent, physical men, living men, sent by the seven churches to find out the state of the aged apostle who was now in exile in Patmos. However, human messengers don't qualify to be regarded as stars. So there must be more to the addressee than is apparent. And incidentally, in the early churches, bishops were regarded as being the equivalent of angels. Well, the message of the seven churches strikes us as being strangely and repetitively structured. And the fact is that these messages are written in covenant terms or in contractual terms. And this is strange because there is no such thing as a covenant with the church. So why is the Lord speaking to the church 
in covenant terms. I mean, doesn't Calvary cover it all? Let's look at these covenant characteristics a little closer. First, there are two parties to each message, the Lord and the church. Second, there is a distinct characterization of the first and the principal party to the covenant. Three, there is an evaluation of the church or second party, which includes positives and negatives. Fourth, there is a recommended course of corrective action. Five, dead giveaway on a contract and a covenant, there is a penalty clause. And six, there is a bonus clause. There's a penalty and there's a reward. Now this is like the annual appraisal that we used to give in business and industry. And in this case, every single one of these churches gets this appraisal and gets spoken to in covenant terms. And this leads us to the big question, which I have never heard anybody ask. And if we cannot answer this question, we need to stop any further inquiry into Revelation until we can. Because this question is the key to the cohesion and the unity of the Christian mission and of the apocalypse. What is the question? Why is the Lord talking to these churches in covenant terms? Some of the best remembered scenes from Christ's life involve the healing of lepers. Yet for most today, that dreaded disease is dismissed as something from history. Yet in India, world missionary evangelism is still reaching out to minister to lepers. Deemed untouchables by those around them, our doctors, nurses, and ministers embrace lepers as Christ did. Through our clinics, we treat the disease one patient at a time. And through our witness and ministry, we treat their souls one person at a time. We provide them with food, clothing, medical care, and love. We bring value and healing to those whose life once had no value. The evangelism and world missionary evangelism is not just a part of the name. It defines our mission, our focus, and the heart of our work. And nowhere is this more apparent than in our work with letters.